Good morning and welcome to Cherry Hinton Baptist Church. We are here to a revel in the presence of our life-giving God uh, and we're going to do this so that we may reveal that to others. And uh, I'm going to start by something that's uh, quite upbeat uh, from uh, uh, Matthew chapter 5. I'm just checking whether Scott's in the building. If Scott is there, if not, I'm going to switch to Lorraine, okay? So um, normally this passage from Matthew 5 says, blessed are the poor in spirit. Uh, and I'm not sure uh, whether this is true for you, but blessed sounds like a very pious saint who's blessed. And it's sort of quite quiet. And uh, there's a view that the original is more summed up in saying, oh, the joy. Okay. So, Lorraine, you could uh, unmute yourself and uh, do the joys. Oh, the joy of the poor in spirit. For theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Oh, the joy of those who mourn. For they will be comforted. Oh, the joy of the meek. For they will inherit the earth. Oh, the joy of those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. For they will be filled. Oh, the joy of the merciful. For they will be shown mercy. Oh, the joy of the pure in heart. For they will see God. Oh, the joy of the peacemakers. For they will be called children of God. Oh, the joy of those who are persecuted because of righteousness. For theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Amen. Um, uh, just going to uh, pray that we might hear what God is saying to us about abiding. Uh, Heavenly Father, uh, be with us as we listen to John chapter 15. As Alison guides us through it. We pray that you would speak to us, that we would have listening hearts, for we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. And um, so this is going to be read to us by Faye in the first place, and then Chloe. So if, uh, Faye, you could unmute yourself, um, and then it will be Chloe, um, uh, when we get to the third slide. Thank you very much. Faye. I am the true vine, and my father is the gardener. He cuts off every branch in me that bears no fruit, while every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes so that it will be even more fruitful. You are already clean because, the, because of the word I I have spoken to you. Remain in me as I also remain in you. No branch can bear fruit by itself. It must remain in the vine. Neither can you bear fruit unless you remain in me. I am the vine. You are the branches. If you remain in me and I in you, you will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. If you do not remain in me, you are like a branch that is thrown away and withers. Such branches are picked up, thrown into the fire and burned. If you remain in me and my words remain in you, you, you ask whatever you wish and it will be done for you. This is to my Father's glory, that you bear much fruit, showing yourselves to be my disciples. 
Uh, and now switching to Chloe. Sorry. That's As quite okay, you're now muted. I'm muted. As the Father has loved me, so have I loved you. Now remain in my love. If you keep my commands, you will remain in my love, just as I have kept my father's commands and remain in his love. I have told you this so that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be complete. My command is this, love each other as I have loved you. Greater love has no one than this, to lay down one's life for one's friends. You are my friends. If you do what I command, I no longer call you servants because a servant does not know his master's business. Instead, I have called you friends. For everything that I learned from my father, I have made known to you. You did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you so that you might go and bear fruit, fruit that will last. And so that whatever you ask in my name, the Father, I will give you. This is my command, love each other. Thank you uh, very much. I'll just do a couple of adjustments at the front of the church and then we will be ready to hear. Okay. Good morning and thank you very much for inviting me to give the last in your summer sermon series. Let's practice saying that. Looking at Jesus' I am statements. And today, as Nick has said, and you've seen in the reading, we're looking at Jesus' claim that Jesus is the true vine. Until relatively recently, there weren't that many vineyards in the UK, but that's changing. And according to the Ordnance Survey map, I brought the lockdown. There's even a vineyard in Cambridgeshire, in Chilford Hall near Linton, if anybody's visited it. But I think we're all probably all familiar with pictures such as this one on the screen uh, from France. The vines full of fruit, way down with grapes. One year I got to see a vineyard when it had just been pruned. I thought I'd be moving to Luxembourg to take a job. So I drove over one February to house hunt and I took a few hours out and drove up into the hills and came across this, this vineyard which had been pruned, not this one particularly, but it did look like this. And I was shocked by how desolate and barren a pruned vineyard looks. It just seemed impossible that in six months time it would be full of fruit and grapes. And actually, as an aside, looking back on that visit to Luxembourg 25 years on, I recall that my life at the time felt rather like that prune vineyard, and things seemed to get worse when the job in Luxembourg fell through. But that failed attempt to work abroad inspired me to apply for other jobs abroad, which turned out to be very fruitful indeed. So God is a good gardener. Jesus' disciples, of course, would have been much more familiar with vines and vineyards than we are, not just from the countryside around them, but from their scriptures. I was surprised to discover that the first reference in the Bible to vineyards is back in Genesis 9, when Noah plants a vineyard not long after he comes out of the ark after the great flood. Though I have to say Noah's first experiment with the fruit of the vine was a complete disaster. Dried grapes, raisins, were very much a food in biblical lands and I think possibly something of a, of a luxury gift. So in 1 Samuel, 
we find Abigail bringing 100 clusters of raisins, dried grapes, to David. She att attempts to prevent a battle between David and her then husband, Nabal. So that reminded me of the little boxes of raisins parents often carry with them to ward off a temper tantrum because their children's blood sugar is low. But as well as these very practical uses, vines had huge symbolic significance for the Jewish people. Vines were seen as a sign of prosperity and peace. But much more than that, the people of Israel saw themselves as God's own vine. The psalmist says that God brought the vine of Israel out of Egypt and planted it in the promised land. But Isaiah tells us that though God labored over the vineyard, God labored over the people of Israel, as all good vine growers, or indeed any gardener, must labor over their garden. The vines didn't. In other words, as Isaiah goes on to explain, Israel abandoned justice and righteousness and became greedy, corrupt, and materialistic. The people of, e of Israel called evil what was good and called good what was evil. Israel, which stands for all of us, was not capable on its own of keeping the commands of God and producing good fruit. So I hope we can now hear again something of how powerful a statement it is when Jesus says, I, Jesus, am the true vine and my father is the gardener, the vine grower. Jesus takes that image which the people of Israel had of themselves as God's vine and says that God has provided a new way for everyone to belong to God, of being God's vine, and that is through Jesus. There is a new way of bearing fruit, good fruit for God, through Jesus. In the I Am Saying you looked at last week, I Am the Way, the Truth and the Life, Jesus stresses the importance of believing that, believing in Jesus, believing God is working through Jesus, and the importance of having faith. Belief and faith are important words about our mind and our will, what we choose to think, who we choose to trust. In our reading this week, Jesus uses a different word to describe this incredibly rich relationship we have with him. Jesus talks about remaining in Jesus, or as the older versions of the Bible have it, abiding in Jesus. Now, as we could see of the highlighting in the passage when it was read out to us and in this extract, Jesus uses the phrase remaining or abiding in me 11 times in these few short verses. Any teachers among you might be tempted to write, please vary your vocabulary, please use different words if the passage was submitted as homework. In the Bible, of course, on the other hand, repetition is really a sign that we need to take something very seriously. It's a way often used to emphasize a point. And the repetition emphasizes the fact that remaining in Jesus is not only really important, but it's not an individualistic goal. It's not intended just so I can feel secure, and safe, and everybody else can look after themselves. No, we are called to remain in Jesus so that we may bear fruit. Now there's lots and lots of different ways to bear fruit for God, but I want to concentrate this morning on three of the fruits which Jesus singles out in this passage, because I think they also help us understand a bit more about what Jesus means when he says, remain in Jesus and let Jesus remain in us. And the three fruits I'm thinking of are love and joy and peace, which happen to be the first three fruits of the Spirit in Galatians, first, which Paul talks about in Galatians. Let's start with love. So in verse 9, Jesus tells us to abide, to remain in the love which he has shown us, and which is the love of God the Father. To be fruitful for God, we must first accept Jesus' love for us. We receive God's love as a gift. We haven't earned it, we can't earn it. 
But it's also true that God's love for us does not bear fruit in our lives unless we then love in turn. Indeed, Jesus does not just ask us to love, he commands us to love. And again, as you can see from the green, that's something he repeats. Now, I think to our modern ear, that sounds very strange. In the modern era, love tends to focus a lot on emotions, on how we feel. So the idea of commanding someone to love sounds not just old fashioned, but possibly even a bit coercive. But the sort of love Jesus is talking about here is not about feelings, it's about actions. As verse 13 shows, God didn't come to us to tell us that God feels love for us. He demonstrated love in action, in the ultimate way, the ultimate action anyone can take by laying down his life, by Jesus laying down his life for us, his friends. Some of you will know that I spent five years in Belgium and visited many of the cemeteries where those who died in the First and Second World Wars are buried. And John 9 verse 13, or an extract of it like here, greater love hath no man than this, was the verse many families chose to have engraved on the headstone. That's one I actually visited myself. Now, fortunately, few of us will be called to lay down our lives and die for others in that way. But we all know that love is costly. Perhaps during lockdown, we were living on our own. And we had to work out how to love people remotely, despite our own feelings of isolation. Or perhaps we spent lockdown with our nearest and dearest, working out how to love people when you're living with them 24 seven, or caring for your nearest and dearest remotely and being really worried about them. Whatever your experience, I'm sure we all realized afresh just how hard putting love into action day by day hour by hour is. It certainly makes us realise that we cannot love in action without abiding in Jesus' love ourselves. Abiding in Jesus' love means allowing his word to prune and clean us so that we can love more effectively. So for example, during lockdown, sometimes when I was tempted to just despair, so often there would be something in my morning Bible reading which would encourage me to keep going. God helping me through his word to deal with despair in my life. When I felt lonely, praying about that would often bring a thought into my head about a card I might send to someone or someone I might ring or email. If you like, God was teaching me to use loneliness and prompt it to show love in action. As verse 15 indicates, through Jesus, we are in touch with God the Father through prayer and we take part in his work. We receive love, but we also put love into action. What about the fruit of joy? Something else I felt God prompted me to do when I prayed about loneliness was to join a Bible study group at my new church. It's quite an odd experience joining a Bible study group when you've never met any of the people in real life, but it's turned out to be a real blessing. And I led a study for them earlier in August on joy. During our study, we decided that joy was security in knowing that God loves us, whatever the circumstances. It's not about personal pleasure or happiness. We feel joy when we know ourselves caught up into something larger than ourselves. And verse 11 says something similar. We receive God's joy when we read God's word, when we hear what Jesus has told us. And then we know ourselves caught up into his great story of salvation, that story which is far, far bigger than we ourselves, but which by God's grace, every one of us is part of. Our home group also agreed that too many of us as Christians actually live out of a state of anxiety rather than a state of joy. We don't always feel secure in God and we know that fear and anxiety are very draining of our energy, our physical, emotional and spiritual energy. Instead, our goal should be to live from a spirit of joy. As Nehemiah says, the joy of the Lord is my strength. 
But we also concluded that joy is not something just to be received. Yes, we should pray for it from God, but we shouldn't just sit passively waiting for it to arrive. One of my favourite authors that an American friend taught me about is the Canadian Anne Voskamp, whose first book is called 1000 Gifts, A Dare to Live Fully Right Where You Are. A friend dared Anne to start counting 1000 things for which she could be grateful, things which she loved, small graces she experienced. And Anne found that as she did this, she was looking out more actively for moments in which to give thanks. It's a bit like Lorraine was saying earlier in her testimony. It's when you reflect, when you give thanks, that you experience joy. And Anne found that it nearly always works that way around. If you wait till you feel joy before you give thanks, you're shortchanging yourself on joy. If you look out for things to give thanks for, you are opening a pathway to joy. And having read Anne's book, I started to do that myself at the beginning of 2016. Every week or every couple of weeks, I write a list of at least one thing every day for which I can give thanks. I had a quick look at that list when I was preparing for this sermon and it gave me fresh joy to read it through and remember. And I found that this does work even in the most difficult of circumstances. So I was reading the bit of this sort of thankfulness diary around the time my beloved father died. Now, obviously, I couldn't give thanks for that, and I don't think God expected that. But I could give thanks that I was able to get back from Belgium to be with Dad when he died. I could give thanks for the friends who drove over on the same day to be with me so that I wasn't on my own. I could give thanks for the neighbour who planted flowers in the empty pots in Dad's front garden the day before the wake. All of those brought me moments of joy, even in the midst of great, great sadness. And finally, the fruit of peace. Now, you might be forgiven for asking why I'm mentioning the fruit of peace when the word peace does not actually occur in today's passage. My defence is that I think peace is very much what Jesus has in mind when he talks about us remaining in him and allowing him to remain in us. In church, we spend quite a lot of time praying for the peace of God to be with us. So we know that peace is a gift of God. But we can also be active in growing the fruit of peace. We can practice forgiving ourselves and others when we get things wrong and learn to let go of the resentment and bitterness which destroy our peace. If we've been hurt badly, this may take many years, but we keep going. We can learn to refocus our attention. So perhaps we set aside a time to tell God about our anxieties and to pray about them, but then consciously choose to think about them, sorry, to think about something else, or to concentrate on something else, or do something else. We can perhaps memorise a verse from the Bible or a prayer to repeat so that we fill our minds with God's words rather than anxious or angry thoughts. Or as the slide suggests, we can make sure we balance our very natural worries about the future with positive thoughts about the opportunities of the future as well. Through all of these techniques, and I'm sure you, you have many more that you can share with each other, Abiding in God then remains something very active and purposive. And growing the peace, the gift, sorry, growing fruit of peace is also something that we can work with God on. So, showing the fruits of love, joy, and peace in this world, not denying the difficulties, but demonstrating love, joy, and peace in the way we live and the actions we take is a powerful way to demonstrate to others what remaining in Jesus, belonging to Jesus means. The priest at my last church wrote this recently, which I think puts it well, and I quote, in the midst of a very uncertain future, the call of Christ to his church is not to hunker down and pray that we will somehow weather the storm and re emerge relatively unscathed. No, the call of Christ is to show courage in reimagining and reshaping the future and leading society into more righteous, godly and sustainable ways of living together. 
Some people see a close link between this passage about Jesus of the true vine and the Last Supper, when Jesus gave thanks for the wine and told us to drink it in remembrance of the blood he would shed for us as he laid down his life for us. So as we take communion later in this service, let us pray that God will give us love, joy and peace, and that he will help us put that love, joy and peace into action in the way we live our lives, so that we produce the fruit of love, joy and peace in our lives for the benefit of the world and for the glory of God. Amen. Amen. Uh, thank you very much indeed, Alison. As Alison has just said, we are going to be having uh, communion. Uh, one of the things it's good to do at communion is to uh, confess, to uh, recognise before God, um, knowing that we are forgiven, uh, our shortcomings. Um, I apologise to Ross, who's about to read this, that this reading is partly on the left-hand side of the screen, then it switches to the right-hand side of the screen. Um, and the reason for that is that in terms, of, I just wanted to highlight the, uh, the things on the right-hand side of the screen that we might want to uh, own up to before God. Um, of, yes, I'm finding it very difficult personally to get beyond the first of them about envy, um, that good things happening to other people um, sometimes can get in the way of life in all its fullness and love and joy and peace. Um, and, and to my mind, I think on a personal level, my uh, confession that maybe envy is, 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 is a bit of a problem for me, it, it, it's not so that you know, I can avoid being told off. It, it's for my own benefit that the the naming of something and saying that yes, I've I've done something is is the first part of turning away from it because you can't turn away from something that you haven't admitted that you've got. So it, it's not that I or God wants to hit you over the head. It's uh, God wants us to live more joyful, peaceful, loving lives. So if you think that there's something about envy or boasting or being proud or rude or self-seeking or being annoyed too easily about keeping record of wrongs, about delighting in evil. Let's own up. And as Ros reads this to us, uh, know that uh, God is love, and the God that we are going to commune with in uh, communion. Uh, he is patient, he is kind. Uh, uh, this, this is uh, joyful and hopeful, because we have a way of dealing with envy or boasting or pride, because we're loving, and that if we focus on, on the yellow, on all that's good, uh, life shall be wonderful. Uh, enough of an introduction. Uh, Ros, if you could unmute yourself. That would be splendid. Thank you. Love is patient. Love is kind. Love does not envy. Love does not boast. Love is not proud. Love is not rude. Love is not self-seeking. Love is not easily angered. Love keeps no record of wrongs. Love does not delight in evil. Love rejoices with the truth. Love always protects. Love always trusts. Love always hopes. Love always perseveres. Love never fails. Thank you so much, Ros, for that beautiful reading. Amen. So at this table, gather us in. If we feel lost, if we feel lonely, if we feel broken or breaking, 
if we feel tired or aching, who long for the nourishment found at your feast. Gather us in the done and the doubting, the wishing, the wandering, the puzzled and pondering, who long for the company found at your feast. Gather us in the proud and pretentious, the sure and superior, the never inferior, who long for the leveling found at your feast. Gather us in the bright and the bustling, the stirrers, the shakers, the kind laughter makers, who long for the deeper joys found at your feast. Gather us in to meet and eat, to be given a seat, to be joined to the vine, to be offered new wine, to become like the least, to be found at the feast. Uh, we are invited to come together now. Uh, yes, everybody is back from the room. Good. Uh, we are invited to come together as those who belong to the household of Christ. Uh, we are brothers and sisters who in our baptised lives live out the death and the resurrection of Jesus. We are the family of the reborn and the reconciled who inhabit uh, this universe of grace, this vine that Jesus is in. It's a, a fantastic prayer that uh, comes from the Church of England and it's so based on the prodigal son. Uh, do join in with Kathy at the end for the Christ has died, Christ is risen. Although if you like the prayer that much, you can join in with her earlier. Thank you, Kathy. Father of all, we give you thanks and praise that when we were still far off, you met us in your son and brought us home. Dying and living, he declared your love, gave us grace and opened the gate of glory. May we who share Christ's body live his risen life. We whom the spirit lights give light to the world Keep us firm in the hope that you have set before us, so we and all your children shall be free. On the whole earth, live to praise your name, for Christ has died, Christ is risen, and Christ will come again. Amen. Um, uh, this is a, a, a final... Uh, exhortation uh, for us that I've asked uh, David to uh, read for us. I think it's, it's got a lot of joy and peace and love. Um, thank you, David. Rejoice in the Lord always. I will say it again. Rejoice. Let your be evident to all. The Lord is near. Do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your request to God. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Amen. May you know the blessing of the fruit of the Spirit of love. May you know the blessing of the fruit of the Spirit of joy. May you know the blessing of the fruit of the Spirit of peace today and every day forever. Amen. Amen. Amen.